stand as you're able and join me in the responsive benediction. The laughing one called us together so we could share in the laughter of life. The laughing one sends us out to carry the joy of life and love to the world. Go out to laugh, to live, to love. And when you hear a good joke, remember that sharing is a great thing. Let us join together in singing our closing hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. You may be seated. So you probably noticed that in our bulletin, there are periodically little smiley faces there. Well, those are our joke breaks. So we're going to pause throughout the service at different times and offer a joke. So if you have one in your head that you'd like to share, you're welcome to share it. You also may have noticed that attached to your insert is a joke. Everybody has a different joke in the room. So if you feel inclined during a joke break, just raise your hand and we will bring you the handheld microphone and you can tell your joke. So I'm going to start. The secret of a good sermon is to have a good beginning and a good ending and to have the two as close together as possible. (laughs) Is there someone else that might like to share? Donna in the back. Thank you. 
Um, all right, so Billy Graham, I assured Amy that this was appropriate for church, so. <laughs> Billy Graham was about to do one of his big revival meetings, had flown into an airport, and a big chauffeur-driven stretch limo pulled up to get him. And he came out and he said, oh my goodness, that's a magnificent car. I'd love to take a ride in that. I love limos. He said, but I've never driven one. The chauffeur said, well, hop, you can drive. I'll get in the back. So. He said, are you kidding? And he said, no, please do. It's not that hard. So Billy Graham took the wheel, drove out of the airport, got out on the highway, and lowered his foot on that pedal. And before he knew it, the police were pulling him over. And this young man, young police officer, saw him and said, oh my goodness, Reverend Graham. Um, he said, let me call my supervisor because I can make exceptions. And he said, all right. So the policeman went and called the supervisor and he said, sir, remember how you said I could make exceptions if I pulled someone over for speeding? And he said, sure, I remember that. He said, why, did you pull the mayor over? And he said, no, I'm pretty sure he's bigger than that. And he said, oh my goodness, don't tell me you pulled over the governor. And he said, mm, no, I'm pretty sure he's bigger than the governor. And he said, shut up. You pulled the President of the United States over? And he said, no, he's bigger than that. He said, who the heck did you pull over? He said, I think it's Jesus. Billy Graham is his chauffeur. That's great. Now, hopefully you noticed we're doing the service in reverse. Did you notice that? Oh, okay. Well, hopefully we, we don't get mixed up. We will, we will continue to move ahead, and hopefully we all stay to <laughs> the reverse order. And if I get mixed up, you can just raise your hand and let me know I'm messing up. But we will have more joke breaks. You'll see there's little smiley faces along the way, so we'll have more joke breaks. But for right now, knock, knock. Who's there? Let us. Let us pray. I have one prayer request, and that's one thing I didn't think through, that I wasn't going to have your prayer requests in front of me. So I will share this one, and then we will, you can certainly share them with me if you have them later, and I'll make sure that I pray for you throughout the week with your prayer requests. But we have Alex, Wendy, Harriet, Jewel, Paisy, Vinny, and Suzanne. Let us pray. O oh Lord, giver of joy and laughter, we thank you for giving us these gifts, for the moments of laughter and unbridled joy you give to us, for opportunities to laugh at ourselves, for the belly laughs of children, for friends and family who love us because of our quirks and not just in spite of them, for artists who give us the opportunity to see the world through the surreal, for the courage to smile even when difficulties arise, for those who have hope even when others think there is no hope, for saints in the Lord who overflow with laughter and spread your joy to all of us for the words of Jesus that defy our logical minds, for teaching us that we can be born again, for the woman who finds a lost coin and calls her friends and neighbors to celebrate, for the absurdity of a camel trying to fit through the eye of a needle, for the father of the prodigal son who is willing to look like a fool as he runs to greet his son, for the generosity of the landowner who will pay workers a whole day's wage when they only worked one hour, for tiny bits of faith that can move entire mountains, for the reality that nothing can live unless it first dies, for the great reversal of the gospel, that the last shall be made first, that the rejected stone became the cornerstone, that those who wish to become great must serve, 
that the lost will be found, that the small will become great, that though you are wisdom, you choose to forget our sins, that when we are weak, your strength shines through us. O Lord, giver of joy and laughter, we thank you for giving us these gifts. And yet we know, O God, that there is also grief, sorrow, sadness, and despair for ourselves, for those we love and care for, and for the world. And so we bring both our joys and our concerns to you now in this time of silence, our prayers which are perhaps too fragile for the spoken word. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for the gift you give to us that allows us to enjoy these things to the full. We can laugh because of the most amazing thing of all, that you conquered death, that the tomb is empty, that the light shone so bright that it overcame the darkness. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now we offer back to you the prayer you first offered to us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I'd like to dedicate these offerings, which we are about to receive. God of joy and laughter, we thank you for the lasting happiness you give, which we cannot earn or buy. In gratitude, we bring these gifts, our offerings, and our tithes with the prayer that you will use them to spread the joyful gospel of your great love for all people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And now for the call to offering. Ah, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> One of the discussions the uh, search committee had um, was to answer a question about um, what our church has learned about ourselves and our relationships with uh, people who have provided ministerial leadership. And we came up with seven, but I'm only going to read three. We do well when we listen to excellent preaching, and I'm going to add some innovation, when we hear great music, and when we share joyous times together. And this certainly seems to be one of them. So now, are you ready for another joke? Knock, knock. Who's there? Philip. Who? Fill up the plate as it's passed to you. <laughs> it's time for another joke break. Oh, I see Beverly's hand. I'll make sure. The hardest commandments to live by are the first ten. Yay for spontaneous dancing. So, it's time for the sermon. Now, we're going to do something a little different. Imagine that. I have a little bit of an introduction. I have a little bit of an introduction to the sermon. And then we're actually going to watch... A TED Talk. Up, it's going to be projected right up there. So I'm going to start by speaking to you, and then as you, as we begin the TED Talk, you're invited to come down so you can actually see it. Or if you want to stay there and listen, that's also okay. All right. So please join me in a spirit of prayer. 
O gracious God, may the words of my lips and the lips of Anne Lamont, who you will hear later, be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And so, the quiet reflection of Lent, the sadness, the sorrow, and despair of Holy Week were followed last Sunday by the joy of Easter. And now we continue to celebrate the joy of Easter this season of Eastertide. How many days is it? Oh, come on. This is a pop quiz and you're not passing. Yay! 50! You got it. Ding, ding, ding. There's a prize for that later. (laughs) So laughing in the face of death, which never really has the final say. Wait, what? Is it okay to laugh in the face of death? I recall an occasion as a hospital chaplain while visiting a patient in a palliative care room. Palliative care means that someone really is at the end of life. I was with some family members who had gathered at the loved ones, their loved one's bedside and were sharing stories and photos of family gatherings. And they had invited me to sit with them, and I accepted. The telling of one story ended in raucous laughter. It just happened to be at that particular point where the patient's sister entered the room, and she admonished the younger family members. Someone was dying. How dare anyone be laughing? Is it okay to laugh when sadness surrounds us? While I understand the inclination of this beloved sister in that hospital room, I wonder if she might be missing something important. Under the weight of our grief, our shame, our pain, or that of the world, we can convince ourselves that joy is the enemy. That to celebrate or feel happiness somehow mocks pain. But it is sometimes just the opposite. Joy is the oxygen for doing hard things, as Gary Haugen says. Now, Gary is the founder and CEO of International Justice Mission. That's an organization that frees people around the world from human slavery. The injustice he has witnessed firsthand would make even the sunniest among us heavy with despair. But Gary is the opposite. His levity is contagious. And exactly what sustains him to do the long, faithful work of justice. It is, so I wonder, is it possible to simply choose joy as if reframing our perspective will make things hurt less? I don't think so. I wish there were a magical formula. But no matter how joyful we choose to act, joy does not erase our pain. We are capable of a whole range of emotions that simply coexist with one another. Joy and sorrow, grief and delight, laughter and despair. And so today, we offer the gift of joy and laughter as we worship. So if you haven't already met her, and I'm going to invite you guys to come on down if you so choose, If you haven't already met her, I'd like to introduce you to Anne Lamott. Have any of you heard of Anne Lamott? If you have, just give me a show of hands. Okay, a few have. That's great. She is an author of seven novels, as well as best-selling books of nonfiction, most of which are collections of autobiographical essays about faith. She makes me laugh out loud. Although sometimes a bit irreverent, Anne is ruthlessly honest, compassionate, 
and faithful. I recently discovered that she had given a TED Talk. Are you guys familiar with TED? Yes? If, you, if you're not, Google it when you get home. It's fabulous. She gave this TED Talk in 2017, and I'd like to share it with you and invite us to laugh together. Who wants to tell a joke while we're waiting? (laughs) Okay, I've been practicing this all morning. Who's the best financier in the Bible? Anyone know? It's Noah, because he floated his stock while everyone else was liquidated. Do we need one more? Nope. We don't? Okay. But I will say, in keeping with us doing everything backwards, you'll notice that even our graphics are backwards in honor of today. My seven-year-old grandson sleeps just down the hall from me, and he wakes up a lot of mornings, and he says... You know, this could be the best day ever. And other times, in the middle of the night, he calls out in a tremulous voice, Nana, will you ever get sick and die? I think this pretty much says it for me and most of the people I know, that we're a mixed grill of happy anticipation and dread. So I sat down a few days before my 61st birthday, and I decided to compile a list of everything I know for sure. There's so little truth in the popular culture, and it's good to be sure of a few things. For instance, I am no longer 47. Although this is the age I feel and the age I like to think of myself as being. My friend Paul used to say in his late 70s that he felt like a young man with something really wrong with him. Our true person is outside of time and space, but looking at the paperwork, I can in fact see that I was born in 1954. My inside self is outside of time and space. It doesn't have an age. I'm every age I've ever been, and so are you. Although I can't help mentioning as an aside that it might have been helpful if I hadn't followed the skincare rules of the 60s, which involved getting as much sun as possible while slithered in baby oil and basking in the glow of a tinfoil reflector shield. It was so liberating, though, to face the truth that I was no longer in the last throes of middle age that I decided to write down every single true thing I know. People feel really doomed and overwhelmed these days, and they keep asking me what's true. So I hope that my list of things I'm almost positive about might offer some basic operating instructions to anyone who's feeling really overwhelmed or beleaguered. Number one, the first and truest thing is that all truth is a paradox. Life is both a precious, unfathomably beautiful gift And it's impossible here on the incarnational side of things. It's been a very bad match for those of us who were born extremely sensitive. It's so hard and weird that we sometimes wonder if we're being punked. It's filled simultaneously with heartbreaking sweetness and beauty, desperate poverty, floods and babies and acne and Mozart, all swirled together. I don't think it's an ideal system. Number two, almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes. (laughs) In 
including you. Three, there is almost nothing outside of you that will help in any kind of lasting way unless you're waiting for an organ. You can't buy, achieve, or date serenity and peace of mind. This is the most horrible truth, and I so resent it. But it's an inside job. And we can't manage peace or lasting improvement for the people we love most in the world. They have to find their own ways, their own answers. You can't run alongside your grown children with sunscreen and chapstick on their hero's journey. You have to release them. It's disrespectful not to. And if it's someone else's problem, you probably don't have the answer anyway. <laughs> Our help is usually not very really helpful. Our help is often toxic. And help is the sunny side of control. Stop helping so much. Don't get your help and goodness all over everybody. us to number four. Everyone is screwed up, broken, clammy, and scared. Even the people who seem to have it most together. They're much more like you than you would believe. So try not to compare your insides to other people's outsides. It will only make you worse than you already are. <laughs> also, you can't save, fix, or rescue any of them or get anyone sober. What helped me get clean and sober 30 years ago was the catastrophe of my behavior and thinking. So I asked some sober friends for help and I turned to a higher power. One acronym for God is the gift of desperation, G-O-D, or as a sober friend put it, by the end I was deteriorating faster than I could lower my standards. <laughs> So God might mean, in this case, me running out of any more good ideas. While fixing and saving and trying to rescue is fuel, radical self-care is quantum, and it radiates out from you into the atmosphere like a little fresh air. It's a huge gift to the world. When people respond by saying, well, isn't she full of herself? Just smile a little like Mona Lisa and make both of you a nice cup of tea. <laughs> Being full of affection for one's goofy, self-centered, cranky, annoying self is home. It's where world peace begins. Number five. Chocolate with 75% cacao is not actually a food. <laughs> Its best use is as a bait in snake traps or to balance the legs of wobbly chairs. It was never meant to be considered inedible. Number six. <laughs> Writing. Every writer you know writes really terrible first drafts, but they keep their butt in a chair. That's the secret of life. That's probably the main difference between you and them. They just do it. They do it by prearrangement with themselves. They do it as a debt of honor. They tell stories that come through them, one day at a time, little by little. When my older brother was in fourth grade, he had a report, a term paper on birds due the next day. Yeah, he hadn't started. So my dad sat down with him with an Audubon book, paper, pencils, and brads, for those of you who have gotten a little less young and remember brads, and he said to my brother, just take it bird by bird, buddy. Just write about pelicans, and then write about pelicans in your own voice, and then find out about chickens and tell us about them in our own voice, and then geese. So the two most important things about writing are bird by bird and really god-awful first drafts. If you don't know where to start, remember that every single thing that happened to you is yours and you get to tell it. If people wanted you to write more warmly about them, they should have behaved better. <laughs> Go to feel 
like hell if you wake up someday and you never want the stuff that is tugging on the sleeves of your heart, your stories, memories, visions, and songs, your truth, your version of things, and your own voice. That's really all you have to offer us, and that's also why we were born. Seven. Publication and temporary creative successes are something you have to recover from. They kill as many people as not. They will hurt, damage, and change you in ways you cannot imagine. The most degrading and evil people I've ever known are male writers who've had huge bestsellers. And yet, returning to number one, that all truth is paradox. It's also a miracle to get your work published, to get your stories read and heard. Just try to bust yourself gently of the fantasy that publication will heal you, that it will fill the Swiss cheesy holes inside of you. It can't. It won't. But we really can. So can sing in a choir or a bluegrass band. So can painting community in murals or birding or fostering old dogs that no one else will. Number eight, families. Families are hard, hard, hard. No matter how cherished and astonishing they may also be. Again, say number one. At family gatherings where you suddenly feel homicidal or suicidal, Remember that in all cases, it's a miracle that any of us specifically were conceived and born. Earth is forgiveness school. It begins with forgiving yourself. And then you might as well start at the dinner table. That way you can do this work in comfortable pants. <laughs> when William Blake said that we're here to learn to endure the beams of love, he knew that your family would be an intimate part of this, even as you want to run screaming for your cute little life. But I promise you are up to it. You can do it, Cinderella. You can do it. And you will be amazed. Nine, food. Try to do a little better. I think you know what I mean. <laughs> Number 10, <laughs> grace. Grace is spiritual WD-40, or water rings. The mystery of grace is that God loves Harry Kissinger and Vladimir Putin and me exactly as much as he or she loves your new grandchild. Go figure. <laughs> the miracle of grace is what changes us, heals us, and heals our world. To someone, grace say, help, and then buckle up. Grace finds you exactly where you are, but it doesn't leave you where it found you. And grace won't look like Casper the friendly ghost, regrettably. But the phone will ring, or the mail will come, and then against all odds, you'll get your sense of humor about yourself back. Laughter really is carbonated holiness. It helps us breathe again and again and gives us back to ourselves. And this gives us faith in life and each other. And remember, grace always bats last. Eleven. God just means goodness. It's really not all that scary. It means the divine or a loving, animating intelligence. Or as we learn from the great deteriorata, the cosmic muffin. A good day for God is not me. Emerson said that the happiest person on earth is the one who learns from nature the lessons of worship. So go outside a lot and look up. My pastor said you can trap bees on the bottom of mason jars without lids because they don't look up. So they just walk around bitterly bumping into the glass walls. Go outside, look up. Seek our life. And finally, death. Number 12. Wow and yikes. It's so hard to bear when a few people you cannot live without die. You'll never get over these losses, and no matter what the culture says, you're not supposed to. We cr 
Christians like to think of death as a, as a major change of address. But in any case, the person will live again far in your heart if you don't seal it off. Like Leonard Cohen said, there are cracks and everything, and that's how the light gets in. And that's how we feel our people again far alive. Also, the people will make you laugh out loud at the most inconvenient times. And that's the great good news. But their absence will also be a lifelong nightmare of homesickness for you. Grief and friends, time and tears will heal you to some extent. Tears will bathe and baptize and hydrate and moisturize you in the ground on which you walk. Do you know the first thing that God says to Moses? He says, take off your shoes. Because this is holy ground, all evidence to the contrary. It's hard to believe, but it's the truest thing I know. When you're a little bit older, like my tiny personal self, you realize that death is as sacred as birth. And don't worry, get out of your life. Almost every single death is easy and gentle with the very best people surrounding you. For as long as you need, you won't be alone. But they'll help you cross over to where God awaits us. As Ram Dass said, when all is said and done, we're well, really just all walking each other home. I think that's it. But if I think of anything else, I'll let you know. Thank you. Laughter is carbonated holiness. My favorite quote in her TED Talk. So it's time for a joke break while the choir makes their way back up, if, if you decide to, or you're singing next. So you can stay where you are. <laughs> Who would like, oh, Bonnie. <clears throat> there was an elementary teacher who gave an assignment to her class. Each child got a piece of paper with one word written on it. Johnny got pregnant. He said, teacher, I don't know what that means. And she said, it means to bear or carry a child. OK. So the next day, the students came back with their sentences. And it was Johnny's turn. There was a big fire. And the firemen went up the ladder and came down pregnant. Reading from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortresses, the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Knock, knock. Who's there? Rita. Read of the Bible if you want to hear good news.
Who's got our next joke? Uh, you got it? Becky's coming. <laughs> um, so we hired Reverend Amy um, because she was supposed to be dependable and always, <laughs> always be there for us. But I had an appointment with her earlier this week, and she didn't show. <laughs> so you know what I did? I filed a report with the Missing Parsons Bureau. Make the joyous declaration, in the name of the risen Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Forgive us, O Lord, when we take ourselves too seriously, when we don't claim the happiness that is rightfully ours as your children, when we forget that you will have the last laugh in this world, restore us to the joy of our salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And pr please join me in the opening prayer. O oh, great laughing God, we come into your presence with joy and longing to be surprised. We thank you that you have given to us the gift of laughter and delight. These things give hints as to the nature of your purpose for us and for all the earth. May we find that in giving up to the laughter, there is healing and hope and spirit blessing. Tickle our souls with the brush of your spirit to renew our worship and our living. Amen. Time for a joke break. Who's interested in sharing one? Just raise your hand. All right. Thank you, Sally. Becky is coming your way. How do you know that Adams are Catholic? How do you know that Adams are Catholic? They have mass. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. I now invite you, as you're able, to please stand and join me for the call to worship. Joy is loose in the wriggles of the children and whispers of the youth, the smiles of the adults. We praise God for this glorious day. Let the praise break forth in the most unlikely places and in silly ways. Joy and praise fills our hearts and is in our songs. Let laughter be deep, for we are God's people. Excellent. And so, another joke break. Who wants to share? Okay, hang on one second. I didn't write this. Uh, 
Why didn't Noah ever go fishing? Because he had only two worms. <laughs> Excellent. He had only two worms. Two by two? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Let us join together in singing our opening hymn, Rejoice, Give Thanks, and Sing. at the smiles of your neighbors. <laughs> and so I invite you now to greet one another with a wave or a peace sign or a heart or whatever as we pass the peace of Christ. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Amy Jaguar, and I'd like to welcome you this morning to Pilgrim Congregational Church. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And I hope that you've laughed this morning, that you've found something to smile about, that you've found something to share with someone else that has brought joy to you. And before we leave, I would like to make sure that you know you are all invited to go right down the hallway here to Mamblo Hall and join us in a time of fellowship. And part of my nose just fell off. <laughs> wow. So I hope you'll join us for a time of fellowship this morning down the hall. And I also just want to remind you that we have another opportunity for fellowship 
on Thursday morning from 11 to 12, right down the road at Cape Roots, we have time for coffee and conversation. That's been a wonderful blessing to be able to get to know people in the congregation. And last week, we actually had to go around the table and introduce ourselves to one another because many people there had never met before. So in addition to getting to know me and me getting to know you, it's a chance for you to get to know one another as well. So please join me as you're able for that. And also on Wednesday morning, you can come at 9.30 to Red River Beach and walk with us there for our awe walk, our walking meditation group. So please consider joining us for that as well. Now for our prelude. (laughs) 